Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's the 19th of March. It's time for another batch of deep space updates. And as usual, we're going to go back and start looking at the rocket launches, starting on the 7th of March, where we had a Falcon 9 taking off from Florida, carrying 41 web satellites. Yes, so this is the third and final dedicated launch for OneWeb by SpaceX. Uh, OneWeb is very close to completing their constellation. I think it's one more launch on uh, India's GSLV Mark III. There are going to be some more OneWeb satellites launched for spares on a Falcon 9 later, but that will not be a dedicated mission. Okay, so 9th of March, we had a Long March 4C launching from Taiyun. Uh, it's carrying a Tianhui... Um, 6A and 6B, these are Sun Synchronous Orbit Earth Observation Satellites. Again, don't know very much about Chinese satellites, but they launched them. 12th of March, uh, we had Russia launching a Proton with a Breeze upper stage uh, carrying Olympus K satellite. So this is a, it's believed to be a signals intelligence satellite that goes to geostationary Earth orbit. Now we've previously seen versions of this satellite with similar naming hanging around in geostationary orbit, lurking suspiciously closely to other communication satellites for extended periods of time. So believe that this is going to continue in that questionable tradition. 13th of March, Long March 2C, carrying a Horus 2 satellite. Now again, this is a Chinese launch vehicle carrying a mostly Chinese-built satellite for the Egyptian Space Agency. And again, this is part of China's diplomatic outreach to uh, various nations around the world, basically spending money to buy favors. Uh, 15th of March, we have Falcon 9 from uh, Florida carrying uh, the Dragon 2 spacecraft to the space station, CRS-27, carrying another batch of experiments and uh, other supplies. Uh, I think the experiments that I heard about, there were like things to do with like 3D printed heart tissue to see how they will survive, how they adapt and change to microgravity and some experiments where they're going to put, um, you know, basically biological organisms, like you know, cells and spores into the vacuum and let them sit there and see how they survive, how they, how they return to life after coming back inside. Um, yeah, this was also a, like a, a twilight launch. It looked amazing. It didn't perform a complete boost back, but it did uh, perform a partial boost back. That's basically where they have enough, the, the, the payload is below what they uh, you need, below fuel. So they have slightly, uh, some fuel left in the uppers, in the booster. So they can slow the booster down by doing a boost back, which gives it the massive jellyfish. And that means that it lands slightly closer to shore. So the recovery team takes less time. And Given that it's like Women's History Month or something, SpaceX PR did make a big thing about the recovery team being 100% women in this case. And, you know, obviously they have a lot of women working on the recovery teams, and this is statistically unlikely to have them all on one ship. So, you know, they made them, this happen for PR surf, uh, you know, purposes. And yes, yeah, somebody pointed out that, yes, Doug is the name of the ship, and that is not exactly a woman's name, but ships are canonically female. So yeah, that does mean that the USS George Washington and Ronald Reagan are women. Uh, CRS-27 also included uh, the 50th launch in the experimental launch, Ilana 50, right? The experimental launch of nanosatellites for NASA. Um, could included a bunch of small satellites that will be deployed from the International Space Station, including like ArcSat-1 from the University of Arkansas, the Yukonsat from the Yukon University, and also like AuroraSat and Exalta LightCube and Nidos, which is going to look at, uh, or Nidos, I don't know. It's going to look at cosmic rays. I'm sure there'll be some very cool science and they'll have a lot of fun with their hardware. 15th of March, uh, Long March 11 from Jiquan, that's in the Gobi Desert, carrying uh, the Xi'an 19 satellite. This is into sun-synchronous uh, orbit. Xi'an, we really don't know very much about. They are experimental satellites, possible precursors to other technologies. Since this is going into sun-synchronous orbit, it's probably doing some kind of Earth imaging but yeah, China not particularly forthcoming. This is the, the Long March 11. If you know, that's the one that's like a solid booster, solid rocket motor, and they previously launched it from ships. This time they launched it from the middle of a desert. Okay, uh, 16th of March, 
we had another launch from Rocket Lab at uh, at Wallops, the you know the Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport. This was a mission called Stronger Together, carrying uh, Capella Nine and Ten. So those are synthetic aperture radar satellites for a commercial provider. And yes, seventeenth of March. What a busy day we had. Long March Three B slash E from Ji Chang carrying Gaofen. Uh, 1302 geostationary communication satellite. Then uh, in Vandenberg, we had a Starlink launch with a Group 2-8, you know, a bunch of satellites going to 70 degree orbits. I didn't catch that because I was flying. And 17th of March that evening, we had uh, SES 18 and 19 communication satellites going to geostationary orbit. These are part of the program where satellites are basically replacing older hardware so that the frequencies can be freed up for 5G service on the ground. Wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, you got to the point where you can say, well, what happened to the launch today? Which launch? The SpaceX launch? Which SpaceX launch? Yeah, you know, it, it's wild how much this is going on. Anyway, in the last couple of weeks, um, I guess the one that we were really anticipating was Relativity's la- first launch of the Terran uh, rocket. And the first time they they rolled up for this, it was a long time. There was like basically, they kept on pushing the time back as they were working on propellant conditioning, and eventually they ran out of time. So yeah, their temperatures weren't right. They were probably too warm. They came back a couple of days later, and they counted all the way down, very close to zero. Got the engines lit, and at half a second before takeoff. Something on board said, nope, we are not doing this. And the official explanation that there was a problem with a a corner case in separation automation, and that led to an automated shutdown. They recycled and once again tried to count down, but they stopped that countdown at T minus 45 seconds due to tank pressurization being out of range. We're expecting another launch attempt this week. I think it's currently 22nd, but uh, you know, Look on YouTube, you will see it. Again, we're very much looking forward to this. It'll be, a, you know, this 3D printed rocket. Very awesome stuff. So outside of space news, of course, uh, there is this whole Silicon Valley Bank situation. Yes, and wh- that was huge news, obviously, for me that works in the tech sector and knows a lot of companies. I've certainly had a lot of Silicon Valley Bank checks in my hand and never thought it was a, an un, you know, a bad bet by any means. Now, the problem has been that there's a number of uh, you know, commercial space providers, including Rocket Lab, that have deposits with the bank. Rocket Lab had $38 million in cash there, and they were very worried that only $250,000 would have been FDIC insured. Apparently now the US government is going to make sure that all the depositors are going to be able to access all their money. So that problem is out there. Investors can certainly lose money on the bank because, hey, it's an investment. Um, So yeah, look, that was obviously a big deal. It had a lot of potential to cause stress and trouble there. Um, And I don't know where this is going yet, but, um, you know, it's a modern world. If you have cash in hand, you need to kind of have it with a bank so you can move it around and pay things. So you want to make sure that banks work and you want, yeah. I'm not a banking expert. Yeah, let's just leave it at that. Uh, Crew 5, they returned home. That's uh, Nicole Mann, John Casada, Koichi Wakata, and Anna Kakina. They uh, you know, undocked eight days after Crew f- uh, 6 arrived. They deorbited. They landed in the Gulf of Mexico just west of Tampa. And yeah, everyone is fine. Um, okay, so in terms of NASA news, the US government, or sorry, the president announced his budget, or they revealed, I don't know, they basically came up with a, a budget for NASA. Not much detail right now, but we do know that it is a 7% increase over last year to $27.2 billion. That is really just keeping pace with inflation. It does expand some existing programs, you know, increasing the budget for things like Mars sample return. There are a couple of things, though, that are new that are singled out. One is there's going to be $180 million to develop a propulsion module for the International Space Station, which will uh, ultimately probably cost about a billion dollars, but will be able to safely deorbit the International Space Station to the middle of international waters. Previously, of course, this was planned to be done in collaboration with Russia using a trio of Progress spacecraft and their onboard thrusters. I have a video about that. All the same, 
I would still prefer that they somehow figure out how to preserve this thing potentially in a higher orbit. And certainly it would be cool to send some like actual archaeologists up there to investigate uh, what is left to, to look at the history before whatever happens. You know, at this point is a culturally important site as far as I'm concerned. The other thing in the NASA budget that was commented on was there's a $40 million initiative to look at uh, orbital debris management because with so many satellites now going up into space, it's becoming a more and more important thing. Now, simultaneously with this, there was also uh, the defense budget and that included $30 billion for Space Force, which is the biggest in Space Force's history. About $19 billion of that is basically going to R&D for satellites for things like, you know, missile warning, missile tracking. So yeah, uh, Amazon, they, there was a big conference, whatever, this week where they had a lot of you know, satellite providers coming together and that Amazon unveiled uh, its consumer hardware for its Kuiper network, which is yet to launch, but they uh, straight out wanted to show everybody the hardware they are working with. So they have three antenna sizes. There's a sort of regular size, which is, you know, uh, about 12 inches, 30 centimeters square. It's just, think about a record, right? Um, there's a larger one for the enterprise customers that will deliver gigabit speeds. But the one I kind of like is the dinky little small one, which is about that size and uh, would be very nice and portable. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, I would love to take that camping with me or something. It'd be great if that was mobile. Of course, this whole thing still needs the satellites to be launched. It also was revealed that they have like they've built their own silicon for this, their own baseband chips and everything. So. It's called Prometheus. They're doing a lot of this in-house. Anyway, uh, Firefly, they announced that they have a second Blue Ghost contract from NASA. That's part of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program. So Blue Ghost 2 is intended to fly in 2026. Of course, they're going to have to get Blue Ghost 1 up. That's scheduled for 2024. One important distinction between Blue Ghost 2 is that the contract explicitly requires a satellite deployment in lunar orbit. And this is for the UK built Lunar Pathfinder satellite, which is going to be a communication satellite for payloads on the surface of the moon, specifically on the far side of the moon where the primary payload of Blue Ghost 2 is going to go. Uh, the lander's payload will be the Lunar Surface Electromagnetics Experiment, NIGHT, or Lucy NIGHT, which is basically an experiment to perform uh, radio astronomy from the radio quiet far side of the moon. Now, Axiom had a large event where they showed off their new prototype for the lunar surface pressure suits. They call these the Axe EMU, and it's obviously a, an evolution of the X EMU, which we talked about a few years ago, which never actually happened. Uh, Axion's take seems to be a little bit skinnier, maybe a better proportioned around the waist, makes them look a little less fat. Uh, it's still a design that has uh, a hatch in the back, so the backpack, which looks a little smaller now, is also a hatch. You know, you open that up, astronaut sort of slips in, puts their arms in, and then can close that hatch, lock it down, seal it. Yeah, uh, this is like the way that modern suits are getting designed. One important distinction between this prototype and the real thing is that this was covered in a dark fabric with uh, orange accents to hide proprietary technology. Um, whatever. And the main thing is that on the lunar surface, they couldn't have it that color because that would absorb too much sunlight. So it's going to be a white suit just like before. Although technically, if they were operating entirely in night, it might be advantageous to use a black coating because that would reduce, you know, increase thermal uh, emissivity from the surface. But yeah, I, I don't think they're going to that level of detail. We're going to see a bunch of white suits on the surface of the moon. Axiom have also been confirmed to provide the third private mission to the International Space Station. That could actually happen as, you know, as early as later this year. You know, in a couple of months, I think we've got Peggy Whitson flying up Axiom 2 with a trio of private astronauts. And it looks like, yeah, the, the third mission could happen much sooner than the gap between Axiom 1 and 2. But yeah, finally, I think the biggest and uh, the, the most concerning, I don't know, the news that makes me saddest, honestly, is Virgin Orbit are suspending operations. And this is, you know, suspending operations as of a week ago while they try to figure out their finances. This doesn't look good. It's pretty much, it's very likely to turn into a suspending operations forever situation. 
so, you know, their finances are that they reported back in November that they had something like $71 million on hand and a quarterly burn rate of $50 million. They took in a bit more investment from uh, Virgin Group with the, basically the, the assets of the cut of uh, Virgin Orbit providing collateral. Uh, it doesn't look like they've been able to sort this out and the launch failure in the UK has put them in a situation where they have to fix their rocket before they can make further launches. It's hurt their PR and you know, it seems that they were a little more expensive than before but it is a shame because it's not a bad rocket. It actually has some unique capabilities. Specifically, air launch lets them reach lower inclination orbits than many other providers can reach. But it does look like Cosmic Girl may stop flying and we may never see any other launches from Virgin Orbit. And on that sad note, I think we're that's the end of our news for this week, or in this two weeks. I'll be back in a couple of weeks. And until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.